on an all-new Dr. Phil. This was one of the most desperate human beings I had ever talked to. Kelly Stapleton was charged with trying to kill her autistic daughter. You attempted to end both of your lives, and you failed. Epically failed. She claims her daughter's violent fits put her family in danger. Her daughter gets agitated easily. Izzy's aggression was so severe that Kelly suffered brain injuries. She gave her black eyes, a fractured cheek. She would knock her unconscious and then continue to beat her. She was terrified Izzy would kill her. Plus, do you believe your son can kill you? I know he can. Another desperate mom's confession. I was going to drive head on into the train. You have contemplated killing yourself and your son. I want you to listen to this video. Sobbing followed by horrific screams. Those are the cries of 46-year-old Kelly Stapleton as her then 13-year-old daughter, Izzy, beat her mom bloody during a violent rage. Now, Izzy suffers from what has been diagnosed as a severe case of autism that leaves her unable to control her severe outburst. It has landed her mother in the hospital twice. Now, pushed to the brink, Kelly did the unthinkable. One day last September, she drove Izzy to a deserted area, made her s'mores, and then shut the van doors for what she hoped would be the final time. That day, she attempted to take both her and Izzy's lives. Now, luckily, Kelly and Izzy both survived, but now Kelly sits behind bars facing life in prison for a felony charge of first-degree child abuse. Is this once devoted mother a monster, as some believe, or a mother pushed to the brink by despair? Yesterday, you saw the first part of my exclusive interview with Kelly Stapleton, where she shared her story for the very first time. Today, you'll hear the compelling conclusion to our conversation, and we'll find out how the rest of Kelly's family is coping with this tragic situation. But first, here's what happened yesterday. A Benzie County woman is facing attempted murder charges for trying to kill herself and her 14-year-old daughter. Kelly Stapleton and her daughter Isabel Stapleton were found inside of a van on Tuesday night and unconscious from carbon monoxide poisoning. State police say the 45-year-old Alberta woman tried to kill the 14-year-old girl by placing two burning portable charcoal grills inside a vehicle with the doors and windows closed. All of this unfolding just days after Izzy returned from an autism treatment center. Izzy was put in a medically induced coma. Police say it is possible that Izzy could have permanent brain damage. Kelly Stapleton of Benzie County pleaded guilty to first degree child abuse. Today's guilty plea means all other charges including attempted murder will be dropped. Now a judge must decide her fate. Kelly Stapleton could spend life in prison or get off with time served. Kelly, we're in the county jail right now. Yes, sir. Did you attempt to kill your daughter? I would say no. We were going to go to heaven together. Isabel and her aggression oftentimes targets her sister. I could not keep Ainsley safe anymore. <laughs> How did you decide? that you were gonna do it with the carbon monoxide. I wanted Izzy and I to be able to go to sleep for Jesus to just come in. You get her in your car and you drive out to a very remote place. Did she have any idea what was happening? I said, we're gonna go camping and we're gonna make s'mores and we're gonna cuddle. She was happy. There's a bed in the back of this van. We lay down together. We closed the doors of the van with the grills inside. And we went to sleep, nose to nose. What were the last words you remember Izzy saying to you? I love you, Mommy. Tell me about this. <laughs> I haven't seen that before. <laughs> 
Have you missed her this year? Yes. You attempted to end both of your lives and you failed. Epically failed. And you're glad you failed. You're glad you're alive. You're glad she's alive. Yes. Why? Because she has a journey and it wasn't my right to take her from it. Well, an hour wasn't enough to cover all of the important things that Kelly talked about during our exclusive interview. I still had two burning questions that I had to ask Kelly before our very candid conversation was over. Take a look. Do you want to see her? I do. Have you missed her this year? I <laughs> have. If by some miraculous twist of fate, you could walk out of here today and go home and take up managing her again, are you equal to that? I would not. Not. Why not? I just cannot do it. I can't watch her suffer. <laughs> I can't watch the aggression. I can't be afraid for life every moment. I cannot do it. If you were to look Izzy in the eye right now, what, what would you say to her? That it was always about love. It was always about love. I hurt her. I hurt her. There's not enough medication. There's not enough therapy on this planet to make that okay. You said you believe in heaven. You believe in Jesus. Do you believe in forgiveness? I do. Do you want Izzy's forgiveness? I would beg her forgiveness. Not only did I not take her to heaven. I hurt her. I'm her mother, and I hurt her. I'm not even worthy to beg for her forgiveness. <laughs> Today, we'll see the footage of Izzy when she first got out of the hospital. Plus, how are things going at the Stapleton house now that Kelly is gone and no longer there to take the brunt of Izzy's violence. We'll also talk to another mother who knows Kelly's pain. But before we do that, I want to talk to two of Kelly's best friends, Marlo and Vicki. Take a look as they tell the difficulties they saw Kelly go through. Izzy's autism manifests itself in the sense of aggressive behaviors. She has a difficult time communicating her wants and her needs. Izzy gets agitated easily and she's very impatient. It's uncomfortable to be around her. One day I called Kelly and she was in the hospital. She said that she was waiting for a scan of her face to make sure that her cheek wasn't broken because Izzy had attacked her. <laughs> That's when I started to really realize that something was seriously going on with Kelly and Izzy. Kelly couldn't be alone with Izzy. One time, she was pushed down the stairs when she wouldn't give in to a demand that Izzy had. She was knocked unconscious. Kelly had to call the police. Izzy's aggression was so severe that Kelly suffered three traumatic brain injuries. Kelly was terrorized. Izzy was constantly hitting Kelly in the head, and Kelly was beginning to suffer things such as memory loss. She couldn't find her words sometimes. Everybody was concerned. I'm not sure who else could have gone as long as she did with the behaviors that Izzy had. I'm not sure how anybody could live like that, honestly. Well, I I'm glad you two are here to try and help people get their minds around this. Let me be clear. Neither of you two endorse the choice that she made. No, no. I don't endorse this either, but I do understand that she was lost. I don't know what else to do. I can't get help. I can't get support. I can't protect my daughter Ainsley. I, I feel I have a duty to her, and she keeps getting beaten and pummeled. I, I, I got the feeling that this was one of the most desperate human beings I had ever talked to. Do you believe Kelly thought Izzy was eventually going to kill her? Yes. yes. And she has said that many times. She wrote a blog, and 
the title of the blog was Status Quo. The last day, the day that this happened, she posted this. If you work with families, please try to minimize the soul-shattering disappointments you hand out. And she's talking about healthcare workers, insurance companies, school reps, or th these people. There are ways to say no without being inhumane. Please don't make your problems mine. I'm sorry you have 22 kids on your caseload, but that doesn't mean Izzy should be denied consideration because you're busy. Please don't tell me there are 50 other people on a waiting list to use general fund dollars. Please don't tell me when I found the perfect staff that Medicaid will only reimburse a portion of it. At least let me believe you're trying to figure it out. It's my job to try to do the best for my daughter. It's your job to be professional and help me do mine. And only one of us is getting paid. There's so much more to say. I'm just too tired to write it. This was posted the day she went to the woods. And she had just learned that Izzy had been uninvited to school. During my interview with Kelly, she revealed that she has not seen or spoken to Izzy since that day uh, that they were in the van. And her good friends Marlo and Vicki have seen Izzy and stay in contact uh, with Kelly's soon-to-be ex-husband, Matt. Uh, here's what they have to say about what's happening with Izzy and the family now. Now that Kelly is out of the house, Ainsley is becoming more of a target for Izzy's aggression. Matt told me about an incident of Izzy attacking Ainsley. It was unprovoked, and she had grabbed Ainsley by her hair. They have an escape plan for Ainsley in regards to Izzy's aggression. If Izzy starts to become aggressive with Ainsley, her escape plan is to lock herself in her room or to lock herself in the car. Their CPS worker testified during a pretrial hearing that she had arrived at the house and found Ainsley hysterically crying locked inside the car because she was trying to escape Izzy's aggression. Ainsley shouldn't have to live in a house where she's fearful every day. That was part of her fear and reality. She would take these beatings and watch her other daughter take her beatings. What was her reaction? How did she feel about that? Sometimes she would kind of normalize that to a degree and just say, you know, um, Izzy beat me up again or we had this, you know, conflict, but it's going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. We're going to move on. But then, so, then there were other times when we would talk a little bit longer and then she would really confide in me about how she felt about it. I mean, she would cry and um, those were the times that she felt hopeless. And that's, that's when you started to really, really um, be afraid for her. But where we were at this point is understand that, um, you know, Izzy's aggression as she um, got older became worse. And Izzy became larger and this became more of an issue and Kelly was getting more, you know, it was attacked. Kelly finally found a facility called the Great Lakes Center to get Izzy help. So she's at the center getting help. You would think that Kelly would finally get to relax. She could not because every single week it was up for debate whether Izzy was going to be sent home abruptly or she was going to get to stay. The whole idea was to integrate her slowly back into the house mm -hmm. and that didn't happen. And what we're seeing in the background here is just that this was constant. Yes. Right? And so the insurance company said basically we're not going to further this. It's not being successful. We're going to stop paying. The center said we can't keep her here if we don't have funding for her. And instead of integrating her slowly back home, they sent her home. Mm -hmm. That is the weekend before all of this. And they knew a few days before, so they contacted the school to try and, you know, um, be able to get her in with the teacher there and work on the behavior plan. All of that fell through. So now we have Izzy's coming home. She's not welcome back at school. Um, we know that she's, she's not any stronger than before when she went in. Um, that's where we're at. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to meet a woman whose severely autistic son throws chairs at her, knocks over furniture, tears the stainless steel doors off the refrigerator, punches her, pulls her hair, fractured her ankle, chokes her while she's driving, and bites her so badly she wears long sleeves to hide the bruising.
when he rages out. <laughs> it's horrible, and that's when I'm scared. <laughs> I know my son could kill me. You know, being here in jail, you are away from all of that turmoil. Has there been any guilty pleasure of relief at not having to deal with it? The jail of Benzie County has been a much kinder warden than the jail of autism has been. Now, Dr. Carol Lieberman uh, spent 20 hours over a period of three days doing a clinical interview with Kelly, and she's here today. Dr. Learman, I think everybody does want to understand what her mental state and condition was at the time. What can you say about that? Well, you know, what's important to realize is that Izzy was diagnosed when she was two years old. When Izzy got to be eight years old, she became violent. She had these tantrums, these aggressive tantrums. And the bigger Izzy got, the more uh, violent these tantrums were. And she gave her black eyes, she gave her a fractured cheek, nose, she was hitting her in the head all the time, kicking her in the abdomen all the time. And the final two things were when she um, hit her head so hard that she lost consciousness. The key is, um, I diagnosed Ke uh, Kelly with a number of disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder. It was a war zone in her home. When that day, on September 3rd, 2013, she was in a dissociated state. To her, it wasn't murder or killing. She was, in her mind, taking her to, he to heaven. She was accompanying her to heaven. And that was totally dissociated from murder, killing, anything else. She was doing this as a sacrifice. Even though not intentional, do you believe Izzy would eventually have killed yes. her? Yes, yes I do. Because the violence was escalating, the last two severe things were loss of consciousness. I mean, I mean she could have died then. You know, one of the things I asked Kelly is, did she have information as when she would be knocked out, whether Izzy would continue to beat her after she was unconscious? And she said there was no question about it, that she would knock her unconscious and then continue to beat her. Absolutely. And one of the things that they were thinking of when the school rejected Izzy was for Kelly was even willing to go um, back to where the original treatment center was to continue Izzy in the school that she was going to there. And she was going to live with Izzy alone in an apartment there. And she would have and she was terrified because she figured Izzy would kill her. And also, Izzy would do something like inadvertently start a fire on the stove, trying to cook, and she'd kill herself too. And you know, that's the reality that we're talking about here. Now my next guest lost her husband in a freak car accident. And then four months later, another bombshell was dropped. Take a look. Preston was my first child. I fell in love, but I felt something was not right. I took him to a pediatric neurologist to get tested. It came back that he definitely had autism. As far as I can remember, Preston was aggressive. Even as a baby, he would scratch my face or pinch me. The older he got, the aggression got worse. There was a time that Preston hit me. He punched me so hard that it knocked the wind out of me and it left a huge bruise. He would just open palm, slap me across the face. Don't hit me. He pushed me down the flight of stairs once. I would get bloody lips, broken bones. I've had a black eye. He's fractured my ankle. He's damaged everything, the furniture, the walls. When he rages out, it's horrible. I think he could beat me to a bloody pulp. I know my son could kill me. I love my son Preston more than anything in this world, but I'm afraid of my son and I can no longer care for him. Lisa, I'm glad to meet you. I'm sorry for the circumstance that we're talking about here. Your son is extremely violent. Yes. Uh, do you believe that he can kill you? I know he can. He's been violent for a long time. He's strong. His hits turn into huge welts and bruises and fractures and 
shoved me down the stairs. It's scary. The chokes, his little hands, his hands got bigger. Everything's harder. The aggression has always been there, but now it's worse. I know this is not a happy thought or an easy thought to talk about, but the truth is you have seriously contemplated killing yourself and your son. Yes, I have. It's so hard to translate to everyone, even my closest friends and family, how extreme the behaviors take its toll on you because this isn't just a little hair pull. This isn't a little punch. These are hard pulls, grabbing fists of hair, punches, shoves, breaking things in your house. You're afraid that a spoon or a bowl could be a weapon. It is a weapon, but could that weapon be used on me? We use plastic, so it's hard. And day after day after day, minute after minute after minute of not knowing when those behaviors are going to come and you are the target, emotionally, psychologically, it's tough. This is your child, your child. This is my only child. Let, let's take a break for a minute. I mean, hopelessness has set in for Lisa, much like we've talked about with regard to Kelly. What has she contemplated in her mind? How would she do it? Has she gone to that point? We're going to talk about that escape plan and the horror she and her son have been living in when we come back. Lisa was living a life of constant abuse with her severely autistic son, Preston. Much like we've talked about with Kelly and Izzy, Preston beat her, choked her, broke her bones, and posed a constant danger for others. Now, Lisa spent everything she had, over a quarter of a million dollars, trying to help him, but frankly, life just never got better. So she devised an escape plan that she thought would be an option to end all the pain. Preston loves trains. Preston likes to go for a car ride so many times at night. I just had this vision that I would take him for a car ride at night and just end it, just end the pain and suffering. I would wait for the train, and when I saw it, I was gonna drive head on into the train, and I was gonna kill myself and my son. So I did go to the train track, and I sat there with tears going down my face, and my son was happy flapping his hands, and the train was gone, and I didn't do it. We went home. Preston finally was accepted to go into a treatment facility, so he's still currently there. I feel like I sent him away. I feel like a bad mom for that. No one can understand the guilt that I have, but if Preston were still home, we would both be dead. I couldn't do one more day, one more hour, or one more minute. I w wouldn't just go into, I, I was in my head at those train tracks. I couldn't do it anymore. I could not do it anymore. We wouldn't be here. Sometimes I still feel like I wish we were just dead because it's just hard. What's your reaction to watching yourself say those things? Who says that? What kind of parent says that about their child? Would you have ever thought or fathomed that you as a mother could actually contemplate killing your child? No, never. I'm a normal person. I. I had hopes and dreams for my son when he was born. I can't wait to hear I love you, mommy, and it never happened. And the mom that I thought I was gonna be never happened, and the son that I thought was gonna be was never there. Did I think that I would ever say those words or even contemplate it? Of course not. Who would, who would think that? So I assume you weren't shocked when you heard what had happened with Kelly? 
I was shocked. But it only took 10 minutes for me to, I suppose, come out of shock and say, eventually, if she hadn't, maybe Izzy was going to kill her. And I understood right away, I knew. And I felt really lost and frustrated and angry, never at Kelly, but at the system. You know, Kelly made a comment, the jail of Benzie County is better than the jail of autism. I believe it. I know it. I mean, I've never been to jail, but of course we're in contact and we talk about that often, mm -hmm. how jail is better than the day-to-day -day struggle of autism. Sleep, food, water, no beatings, no, beatings, yeah. no extreme violence by your child. What I, I want people to do is try to understand the mindset. It is not a rational decision. It is not something that I want you to contemplate. It's not something I want you to do. Because there is always that next option, that next alternative, that hope being around the corner. Uh, ending the life of your child, even if you sacrifice yourself in the same, in, in the same act, is just simply not an option. That's just not something that you have the right to do. But that doesn't mean you have to stay in the situation you're in. When we come back, we're going to look at exclusive footage of Izzy after she was released from the hospital. Uh, plus how Kelly's husband, Matt, is coping now that he is the only parent in the home with Izzy and the other children. Not long ago, Izzy beat her mom unconscious in their car. And we were on the highway and she started to overpower me. So pulling my hair, pulling the steering wheel. I knew this was gonna be bad. <laughs> but it was after an even more violent attack that Kelly recorded in a desperate attempt to get help from her local community mental health that she finally reached her breaking point. I was screaming to my local CMH, without exaggeration, that I needed help. Andy Dominiani, anchor, reporter for WWMT, CBS affiliate for West Michigan, has followed this story since day one. Now, Andy was able to interview Izzy, along with her father, Matt, the day she got out of the hospital. Take a look. In a coma for several days, by Friday, the prognosis was grim. If Izzy lived, she would have severe brain damage. But then, by some miracle, everything changed. Izzy began breathing on her own. Then she simply opened her eyes and started talking. She said, tube out. And then Matt came immediately to her bedside and she said, you know, daddy, tube out. So it was like she was gone and then she was just back. We prayed every day and thank God that uh, she came out uh, and pulled through her coma and, and now she's doing fantastic. Alicia, Brian, mm -hmm. Davis. Within two weeks, Izzy was home again. The brain damage caused by carbon monoxide affecting her balance and motor skills, but improving every day. And it's a wonder she's come so far, so fast. When we first met Izzy, she was prone to violent outbursts. Now her aggression has decreased dramatically due to a token reward system where she earns her favorite things. It's incredible. She is doing amazing. Every day, it's more and more of herself. What would you like to buy? Ticket. You go back 10 months and it's a whole different kid. And she's really doing a nice job following our program. We still have a tight schedule and we're trying to keep incorporated all the things that she was doing while she was at the center. Well, Andy, thanks for joining us. You knew Kelly and Matt from college, right? I knew both Kelly and Matt 20 some years ago in college. I heard from her for the first time about a year and a half ago. I knew that they had an autistic child, but I had no idea. And, Nightmare and she contacted you asking you to do a story to try to bring awareness to this situation. She'd been yelling, she said, at the top of her lungs for years. Nobody could hear her. 
She knew I was in the media. She was out of options. I'm sure she didn't want to call me, but she did. I'm glad she did. When this happened, what was your reaction to it? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I didn't believe it. I thought that there must be a mistake. I was in complete shock. Mm -hmm. You visited her in jail. What was her focus at that point? What did she talk about? Izzy. She was talking about Izzy. You've talked to Matt. What did he say? He was very concerned about Kelly, about her mental health. He was so grateful that he got to keep his daughter. He just kept saying, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Can you imagine that? I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I didn't lose my daughter. How do you think he feels towards Kelly at this point? He's conflicted. He loves her. He's furious with her. He's heartbroken. He's hopeful. He feels a million things. And he's in a no-win situation when it comes to Kelly. So what does the future hold? Well, we're going to talk about what the future holds for Izzy. And also, we're going to share with you what Matt had to say to us. Kelly Stapleton is facing life in prison for a felony charge of first-degree child abuse of her severely autistic child, Izzy. I want to introduce to you now the head of our advisory board, Dr. Frank Lawless. He is also a leading expert on autism. He has written a book called The Autism Answer, uh, and it's available as an e-book online. Dr. Lawless, you and I have had a much ongoing dialogue about Izzy and about this situation uh, before I went to do the interview with Kelly. And for people that don't know, I don't want you to glaze us over, but I do want you to give us some sense of what is going on. What makes this child uh, is he? What makes this child, Preston, do what they're doing here? Primarily, it's a brain dysfunction. And what is happening is that especially the back part of the brain is not functioning like the front part of the brain. So what is happening is that there is a limited uh, amount of processing that can go on with an autistic kid when there uh, there's a change in environment there's a change in any kind of uh, situation they get afraid this is they are in panic now autism is a, referred to as a spectrum disorder yes and not all autistic children are violent uh, many are not then some are and what this violence may look random but in fact, it is being triggered, correct? It is absolutely being triggered, and that is the biggest problem in autism, is the emotional control, the emotional management that goes on. All right, and what sort of things, because you say they become very fearful, what sort of things can trigger a, a Preston or an Izzy to become violent and start thrashing? Well, it can be a lot of things. For example, it can be uh, a food, a food allergy that can come uh, come on. It can be basically a, a change in in the environment. It can be uh, a confrontation that, that might even be very mild, but will basically trigger this frantic uh, explosion of resolve. And once this aggressive explosion stops they do not have the ability to pump the brakes. They don't have the ability to soothe themselves and, and quiet themselves down. That's right, and that's the, actually, lack of research in this particular area has to do with this uh, issue of finding the brakes in terms of dealing with their emotional outlet. Dr. Lawless never even asked us to so much as mention his books, but because this is such a specialized area, the autism answer focuses on what parents can and need to know and do in managing an autistic child wherever on the spectrum they are, whether they're, they're violent or whether they're higher functioning, whatever it might be. Absolutely, and the idea is that this is my quest is to basically try to educate uh, the parents what they can do at the home. Right. My plan for the family when we come back. Kelly 
recently pled guilty to a felony charge of first-degree child abuse, a plea that carries the possibility of life in prison. In Kelly's case, though, I don't think that serving time behind bars is necessarily the best solution. If allowed, we would like to provide the court with some sort of alternative for Kelly, starting with an evaluation and a clear mental health plan. I also talked to Kelly about what we want to do for Izzy, her daughter. Kelly, we're going to start working real hard to try to get to the bottom of what's going on with Izzy. We want to take her to the PNP Center in Dallas and do a multimodal diagnostic workup and evaluation of her to try to find out everything that's going on with her. And then once we have those answers, then we're going to get those experts to work with all the resources available to come up with a strategy to try to get this young girl some peace in her life. We want her in the home, in the school, in her community, with friends and a life. And so the whole goal is reunification. We're gonna get busy on this and we're gonna keep you in the loop every step of the way. Okay? Kelly, I, I wish you the absolute best. Thank you. Since Kelly's husband, Matt, is now the custodial parent, we offered him a detailed treatment plan for Izzy. We also offered help for Kelly and Matt's other children, McEwen and Ainsley, as they have been through so much in their young lives. We invited Matt to be here today uh, for a number of reasons he's not, but he did give us a statement and ask us to please read it, and here it is. My apologies. But going out for the filming is not a possibility. I also really think this needs to be Kelly's story. This is her story and about what happened to her. We are grateful for Dr. Phil's generosity in providing help for Izzy. I will certainly work with Dr. Lawless to coordinate these possibilities. As far as the other kids, I appreciate the fact that Dr. Phil would like to help them. This has been a life-changing experience for all three of them and an incredibly delicate situation for the entire family. We want to express our gratitude as Dr. Phil and his medical staff undertake this amazing gesture that will help my family and create awareness for thousands of parents out there. Thank you for your efforts and for going above and beyond. And that's from Matt. So Matt, I, I totally understand. Uh, I thank you. and. Now, Dr. Lawless, you already have been in touch with Matt. You've had contact, correct? Yes, we had a conversation, and we're uh, planning on a visit to the PNP Center okay. this week. Coming up, what you can do if you were touched by Izzy's story and want to help. One thing we want to make clear is that Izzy is a child suffering from a severe case of autism. She is not a monster. She is a beautiful child who needs help. As you know, we sometimes give viewers the opportunity to join us in supporting extraordinary causes. I feel like this is one of those cases. So if you would like to join the Dr. Phil Foundation and support the continuing care that Izzy will need to help secure a healthy and productive future, please log on to drphil.com and you can learn how to help. Uh, all contributions for Izzy's fund will be collected and go towards the services that she needs in the home. Please join us in, in helping to support this going forward. Uh, I want to thank all of my guests today. Uh, a special thanks to Dr. Carol Lieberman for her expertise on Kelly's case. Also a special thanks to the head of our advisory board, Dr. Frank Lawless for his expertise. Uh, his ebook is called The Autism Answer, and you can get it at theautismanswer.com. I highly recommend it. Special thanks to Andy as well. Andy, thank you so much for being here. He is an anchor uh, reporter for WWMT CBS. Uh, that's our affiliate for West Michigan. Uh, for more information on today's show, go to drphil.com. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys.